Well, as I stated, we've, we're in this series, search, the Searching for Significance. And um, as I've said in weeks past, we hear that phrase, and you know, it, it, honestly, it makes me think of uh, maybe going to a retreat or going up to a mountaintop and just getting alone with yourself and just really clearing your head and all these kind of things that we can do to get in touch with our inner self and figure out how we are significant. And as we've been reading through the book of Colossians, we've just really been faced with the fact that our significance is in the fact that if we are a follower of Christ, we have Jesus Christ's Spirit living in us. And that is our hope of glory. That is our hope for significance. And in that is where we gain our power to live the Christian life. We've been talking, uh, in, as we read through this, really looking at, at what Paul is up against as he's in a Roman prison. He's got a, a guy that's come out in Epaphras from Colossae, and he's bringing the message of what's going on in Colossae. And what's going on and what he's really dealing with right now is a bunch of false teachers. People making accusations about Paul, people making accusations about his ministry, trying to uh, make him look bad, um, debunk any uh, credit that he might have uh, as he speaks to people and as he ministers. And he's, only, he's never met the Colossians, if you remember. So this ministry that Paul's having in the Colossians is one through Epaphras, who um, Paul evidently heard Paul's teaching and was discipled and then went to plant this church, but also this letter that he's writing. And uh, what's interesting about tonight, it, it honestly made me think about and just Hopefully you'll understand it here in a minute. This is just where my brain went, and sometimes my brain is kind of weird. But um, <clears throat> how many of you like board games? Anybody? I like board games. I like board games with very few rules. Uh, they just get too complicated, you know? I mean, some of these strategic games, and, and if, once I learn it, it's fun. But board games for me that are really simple and fun to play with a family, that's what I like. Uh, strategic, eh. There's too much competitiveness in there, and I, I just, I'm the laid-back guy that just wants to have fun with people. So uh, growing up, when our boys were growing up, though, we had one in particular who will remain nameless because you all know him. <clears throat> He's not here tonight. How about that? So I'm not talking about anybody that's here, and I did not clear this with him, but I'm not going to mention his name. So anyway, we would be playing these board games, and all of a sudden he would go, wait a minute, there's this other rule and, you know, blah, 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 and uh, it obviously went in his favor, you know, to where he would win or you would lose and he would have another chance to win. And as I was reading through this chapter tonight, I'm just going, man, that's what's going on here. Because what's happening in this chapter, anybody uh, heard of legalism? Is that something you're familiar with? It's when you're living your life and you're reading your Bible, and you're living it based on Scripture, and then all of a sudden somebody else comes in and goes, but wait a minute, if you're a real Christian, you've got to read your Bible every day. You've got to be going to church every single Sunday. That wouldn't work here because we only go on Wednesday nights. All these extra laws, right? All these extra rules. Now, is it good to read your Bible every day? Yeah, it's a great idea. Highly recommend it. But anytime somebody comes along and says, to be a good Christian or to be a Christian, you've got to do this, and it's not in here, it's legalism. And we talked a few weeks ago about how when fishermen don't fish, they fight, right? And one of the things that we do when we're not out there doing what God has called us to do is we go and we start to pick everybody apart. Well, we go, look at that guy's life. Well, I can't believe he did that. Did you hear that, you know, gossip goes right along with legalism. And what was happening in Colossae was these outside forces, false teachers, and it seems to be some Judaizers. If you know the book of Galatians, you know that it was Jesus Christ crucified plus circumcision. Here, it, circumcision is not mentioned, but it's these other rules that they're saying that you've got to follow if you're going to be a Christian. And the way that they came to that conclusion was, well, Jesus was a Jew. He started Christianity so to be a Christian, you first have to become a Jew. And then you have to become a Christian. So you've got to conform to all these laws. And it's just interesting how we get there. How other people impose legalism on us. I mean, back when I was a kid, 
there was a certain section of churches that you couldn't play cards. You know, you couldn't even play a dice game. You couldn't dance. I mean, look at the, mo- the movie Footloose, right? There are just churches that put all of these extra rules on you that were never meant to be there. They're not even biblical. And any time that is put on us, it's legalism. But what we don't realize is that we can put legalism on ourselves sometimes. Anybody ever really wanted to be good enough for God? And you strive and you strive and you strive, and I've got to do this, I've got to be involved in five Bible studies. Maybe that's exaggerating, but, you know, I've got to witness. I didn't witness to enough people this week. God's going to be upset with me. If any of those thoughts have ever gone through your head, you're placing yourself under legalism. And Paul's going to make it very clear here tonight that 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 is putting yourself back under the yoke of something that was never meant to be yoked upon you. Before we start here in Colossians 2, verses 16 through the end, I think it's 23, I want to read 13 through 15 because 16 starts out with therefore, and anytime you see the word therefore, you need to go see what it's there for, you know? And so I'm going to read 13 through 15. We're going to see what it's there for. It says here in verse 13 through 15, it says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And so, therefore, because of all that, because of what Jesus did for us is how he's starting this all out. Because of what Jesus did for us, and because of now our right standing as believers in Christ and him, it says here in verse 16, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regular or regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. This is where the Jews were coming in. They were saying, well, if you're going to be a Christian, then you have to keep all these festivals. You can't eat pork. You can't eat, you know, we couldn't eat catfish. I don't know if you've looked through the Levitical law and the Mosaic law. There, you can't eat a, a fish that does not have scales. So catfish, off the board. Shark, off the board. A pig has a split hoof, but it only has one stomach. So it's got to be split hoof with multiple stomachs. And so what they're doing is they're trying to place Christians under the law. They're basically saying grace, for you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. It's, It's works. That's works. Living by the law is works. I missed a part in the verse there. Not of works, lest any man should boast. They're trying to place them under the law. And this even became such an ordeal that back in Acts 15, verses 7 through 11, Paul and Peter have come to Jerusalem to address the Jewish council. The the Jewish church in Jerusalem had been trying to hold these people to the same standards, asking them to, or expecting them to follow the law. And here's what Peter finally stood up and said. It says here in verse 7, After there had been much debate... Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And he's talking about in Acts Acts 10 where Peter's up on the rooftop and he has this vision. And the sheet's lowered down. And it opens up and there's all these unclean animals. And Jesus says, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And I've always said that was my life verse, right? That's why I'm a hunter. God said so. A little out of context, but anyway, he says, uh, no unclean things have touched my mouth. And God says, in short, "Nothing uh, nothing that God has made clean is unclean. And so at that moment, Peter has this vision and gets this message that the Gentiles were to hear the gospel as well. Verse 8, and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. 
Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? In other words, we've not been able to hold it, carry out the whole law. We've not been able to hit every mark. And now you're going to put that on a Gentile? Somebody that wasn't even you know, raised in Jewish tradition or any of this stuff. Verse 11, but we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ just as they will. And so the, that's the background of how Paul's coming to this and saying, let no one, let no one pass judgment on you by these things. You see, as, as we study, especially if we study Romans, we see that we are not under the law anymore. We're under grace. We don't have to keep every letter of the law. Are there some benefits to some of it? Yeah, there probably are. I've never tried to follow it, except for the Ten Commandments. I've never tried to cut out pork. Bacon tastes too good. But that's not how we're supposed to live. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. We'll see here in just a second more about that. Verse 17 says, These are a shadow, talking about the the food and the drinks and the rituals and the festivals and the Sabbaths and all that. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. The substance belongs to Christ. You know, I'm standing up here and I can see my shadow. If you look at the shadow, it doesn't look like me. It's just the kind of the weird way that the light, you can tell that I'm the one casting it. But uh, that's what you see in a shadow. As, as somebody's coming along the road and they're around the corner, you can kind of see their shadow. If the sun's in the right spot, the shadow actually gets seen before you see the person. And what Paul's saying here is the law is the shadow of the substance, which is Christ. In other words, the law basically tells us that we're sinners and what sin is. And Jesus came to complete it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you must be perfect as my Father is perfect. He's basically setting them up and saying, there's no way for you to accomplish it. That's why I'm here. And so the substance of this is Christ. He goes on to say, let no one disqualify you. Now first, they're not supposed to condemn or pass judgment. Here it says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on Ascentism, I guess that's how you say it, and the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by the sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. Some of this language can be confusing. I've never heard of, other than scripture, I've never heard of ascentism. Basically, what it is, is false humility. If you remember Jesus talking about fasting with the disciples, he said, don't fast in a way that you walk around, your face is gloomy and glumpy and glumpy, grumpy, you know what I mean. And you not walk around, like, look like you're in pain. And then somebody goes, what's wrong with you? Oh, I'm fasting. So you can look really holy. That's false humility. If you're going to fast, and I encourage you to fast, fasting helps you think about what you're craving. And it makes you realize that uh, three meals a day, I'm pretty, I'm good for a day at least. Maybe more. It helps you focus on who you should be hungering for. But Paul says, don't do it in this false humility. Don't worship angels. Now, that sounds weird. But as much uh, mysticism is out there, this is actually a really common thing. If you ever want to uh, see and, and look up some ways that uh, New Age beliefs have entered into the church, search top, top five New Age practices that are in the church today. And, and there's acts of mysticism that are being practiced in Christian churches today. One of the most common ones is the law of attraction. If I believe it enough, if I say it enough, I will obtain it. That's the law of attraction. 
and that is mysticism. Here, it's worshiping angels. There's even a part of this false humility that plays into worshiping angels because they've played themselves down so much that they don't even believe that they're, they're worthy of worshiping God, so they worship the next best thing, which is angels. And it's all a false teaching. It's all misleading. <clears throat> Going into deep detail about visions puffed up with reasons, Behind the sensuous mind. You know, all these things are ways of the world. What they are not doing, and this is the most important thing out of this, this paragraph here, is they are not holding fast to the head. Notice the word head there, at least in my Bible, is capitalized. And he's talking about Christ. Christ is the head of the church. We, we talked a couple weeks ago about how that word head, uh, in one, sim, uh, one way, is symbolizing a headwaters. You know, you have the continental divide. And you have rivers that come out of that continental divide. And where it comes out there, that is the headwaters. That is what supplies all of the water to that river. And Jesus is the headwaters of the church. And we need to hold fast to him. You can't hold fast to him uh, in, in an effective way unless you have a relationship with him. And you can't have a relationship with him if you don't know him. That's the crux. That's what sets this, the Christian belief, apart from every other religion. Because it's not about works. It's not about being good enough. It's not about all of these things that you have to obey. We are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift. I didn't do anything to earn it. I, if I can't do anything to earn it, I can't do anything to lose it. Right? Right? How can you lose a gift that's given to you? All you can do is reject it. So we're talking about a relationship with, with God. A God that came down to this earth in human form, the person of Jesus Christ, so He could be revealed to us, so that we could know Him better, so He could walk three and a half years on this earth with men that wrote stories about Him, so that we could read about Him and know Him. And we need to hold fast to Him. Him and Him alone. Anytime there's anything else added to Jesus Christ, it's a false teaching. Paul even says in Galatians, if, if anyone comes to you, even an angel, even me, with a different gospel than you heard originally, let him be accursed. That is strong language. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. What is the benefit from holding fast to the head? It says here, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Guys, this is why we gather together. This is why we gather on Wednesday nights. This is why we gather in small groups. This is why we gather in discipleship relationships. So God can knit us together. It is Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him that causes all those ligaments and tendons to connect us all together. We've got to hold on to the head. When we slip into the trap of legalism, we move away from the true gospel. You are putting yourself back in the shackles of the law or possibly even a whole different set of man-made rules and unbiblical expectations. We must hold fast to the head that is the Christ. In John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Religious activity doesn't necessarily cause you to abide in Jesus. You being here tonight, just attending church, doesn't necessarily cause you to abide in Him. It's really when you go home and you decide, I need to know Him. And so you open up the Word, and you read about Him, and you study about Him, and you get commentaries, and you go out... I trust Peter, but I want to find out for myself. 
The Berean church was, was uh, held on, at high acclaim because they didn't just believe what they heard. They went back home and they studied the scriptures to make sure that what Paul was teaching was true. And that strengthened and it multiplied the depth of their, their relationship with Jesus. You might hear me saying in that, well, you need to be about like the Bereans or you're not a true Christian. No. We can be saved. We can have salvation through Jesus Christ and spend eternity with Him. But if we're going to walk through this life with a deep relationship with Him, we need to hold on to the head and, and really develop that relationship with Him. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. Let's keep reading here in Colossians 2, verse 20. It says, and, and this is honestly, this is when I was making out the bulletin. Joanna normally does that, so I had a lot of extra work today. But it's, that was, this is the key verse. This next verse I'm going to read is the key verse. And I want us to, if we can, and we can, if we will, memorize this verse. It says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, in other words, the flesh, the way our fleshly bodies work, our minds work, all of the, the way that humans do things. The reason that we have all these other religions is because they're all designed the way man would design them. Only God would set up and say, you know what? You don't have to do anything but believe in me and I will save you by grace through faith. Man is the one that comes along and says that, yes, this is this mighty man that we're going to hold up in high acclaim, but now you have to do this, 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 and this. In Islam... You can live the perfect life and you still have no clue whether you're actually going to heaven or not. Man-made religions. I'm going to continue reading. (laughs) If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Embrace the grace and the gift that God has given you. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. I, I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, when I was growing up, that's kind of how I understood it. Well, Christianity is this list of rules. There's things I can do and there's things I can't do. There are freedoms in the Christian life. Remember, Paul says uh, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but I, I should be mastered by nothing. In other words, I have the freedom to do certain things in my life if I want to. The only things that I should not do, shouldn't murder anybody, shouldn't have a a God before the one true God, shouldn't make any engraved images. The Ten Commandments, those are some pretty serious, shouldn't do that. Even if you break them, though, and we all do, it doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't still save you from your sins. They're just some really important ones. But we should not submit ourselves to the regulations. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to the things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. Not God's precepts and teachings, but human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in provoking self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. Have you ever run across a religion where to be holy, they like, they cause harm to their body? I mean, it, there's, <laughs> there's all kinds of crazy religions out there, and it's all man-made. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What Paul's saying here is, guys, we have this life. If you remember a couple of uh, weeks ago, we talked about walking in a manner worthy of, of the Lord, pleasing to Him. That's our goal. As, as we live out our life, we don't need to walk in a manner worthy of, of earning His acceptance, earning His approval. We need to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. He is perfect. He is God. He came down and died for us. So in response to that, live out our lives in a manner worthy of what He did for us. Why? Because of our love for Him, not out of any obligation. Because all these other man-made religions and all these other rules that we might want to pile on ourselves, they don't do anything for changing how we live. Right? How many of you ever disciplined yourself in a really strict diet? Anybody? How long did that last for you? 
And what happened when you stopped doing it? Now you're saying, Peter, this is not a diet. We're talking about faith here. I understand. But there are things that we can do in our life to discipline our body, right? To condition ourselves. I just did some of that this morning, and my body hurts. Okay? I think I said that last week, too. It hurts, and I'm tired. But anyway, I can discipline myself, and I can put myself on a keto diet. And I can even lose weight. But guess what? As soon as I stop doing those things, um, <clears throat> if I keep eating all that stuff but not really looking at the quantities and all that other stuff, I'm going to get fat again. Doing all of these rituals, the, the new moons, the Sabbaths, the, the eating the right food and not eating the wrong food and the drinks and all of that stuff, we can suscept ourselves to legalism if we want to, but it does nothing for us actually living out a life that is worthy of the Lord. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 1, and then I'm going to skip down to 13 through 15 here. Paul talks to the Galatians about living in freedom. If you've been through the 21-day transformational process, you will recognize this verse. But it says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. That's a real complicated concept there. He didn't free us so we would be in bondage. He freed us from bondage so we would be free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Do not, do not submit again to the yoke of our sin, our flesh. Right? Jesus died for our sins. Why then would we submit ourselves back to a yoke, maybe not even of our flesh, but of our fleshly, worldly ways, which is religion, which is the law, which is placing ourselves back in bondage to these rules that don't do anything to help us live the godly life. Going down to verse 13 here in Galatians 5, it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You ever hear that? People say, well, the, the whole law is summed up in two things. Love God and love others. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. In other words, guys, we were freed. We were freed from all that. And in response to that, we should love our neighbor as ourselves. As Christ followers, born-again believers, we have been made alive in Christ. We have been set free from our sins. Our sin has, was crucified on the cross with Jesus. We must stand firm and not submit again to the yoke of slavery, whether someone suggests you should or whether you are willingly uh, putting yourself under the yoke of legalism. Stop it. We're either living under grace or we're living under the law. And living under the law accomplishes nothing. Embrace the grace that God shows you and the power of grace that He actually gives you to transform your life. If you don't like where you're at, if you're stuck and you're struggling because you just can't get out of a habit or out of a stronghold like we were singing about before I came up here, God has already done the work. The only thing holding you in that stronghold is you choosing to keep walking in that stronghold. It's time that we embrace grace. Live in the freedom that Jesus died to bring you. Rest in the truth of who you belong to and that there is nothing you can do to deserve it and there is nothing you can do to cancel it out. That is why it is so important to know the truth of God's Word, the truth of who Jesus is and who you are in Him. It is so important to see the enemy's gains of false information and call them on it, just like my son who wanted to add rules to board games so he could win. Now, please hear me. I'm not comparing my son to Satan, okay? I realized when I wrote all this out, it's like, Satan wants to do that. And I don't, that's, I'm not equating him with Satan. It's just the same game. Satan wants to come into your life and go, I thought you said you were a Christian. 
When's the last time you went to church? If there's an accusation coming out about you and your walk with the Lord, it's not coming from me. If I ever see you and tell you that I'm, I miss you, it's because I miss you. It's not because I'm keeping track of how many times you come to church. It's not the point. We're talking about relationship here, not religion. Satan wants to twist things. Satan wants to add rules to something that's not there. He wants to remind you of who you once were. He wants to degrade you for the things you're struggling with. And he wants you to forget about the fact that Jesus has actually already set you free. Stand firm in your freedom. Let's pray.